Hi everyone, sorry about the delay on, on coming over uh, to this. We got held up with uh, Dr. Boys uh, talking about medical trauma. So if you'd just bear with me for one second. Thank you. So I hope everybody's enjoying all the information we're learning today. I know I am as a, as a mito mom, I'm learning information and relearning information that I thought I knew. So it's great to get these refreshers. Um, I'm really excited today to uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Arnold here with us. Uh, she's a graduate from the University, Indiana University with a degree in biology and chemistry. And she has a master's degree in medical genetics from Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis and graduated from the medical school at Upstate Medical Center in New York. She completed residency at pediatrics at Northwestern University and a fellowship on genetics at the University of Colorado. Dr. Arnold is board certified in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and clinical biochemical genetics. Boy, sometimes I struggle with some of those. Previously, Dr. Arnold was, uh, was faculty at the University of Arkansas and the University of Rochester. She is now a professor of pediatrics and clinical research director at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Her main interest is clinical research and in inborn errors of metabolism. She's currently conducting numerous clinical trials for a variety of medical metabolic disorders and is the longitudinal, longitudinal project principal investigator for the National Rare, Rare Disease Consortium for PKU. Dr. Arnold has authored more than 70 medical publications and received the, I hope I say this right, Shapira Award for the best publication by a Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders and is a member of the journal Molecular Genetic, Genetics and Metabolism for her paper, Adelphi Clinical Practice Protocol for the Management of a Very Long ACEL-CoA Dehydrogenase Deficiency. She has presented papers at numerous national and international meetings and is currently the president of the Society of Inherited Medic Metabolic Disorders. So I'd like to thank you so much for coming back. We're honored to have you with us again this year. I'd also like to remember that we will be having some polling questions during this, uh, this session. So please keep an eye on that on the left-hand side of your screen. And we would appreciate you providing your feedback to help us better understand the topics for which you'd like more information. Well, thank you. Yes, I'm honored to be here. And <clears throat> I hope that um, this talk is helpful to people. So I want to start out by talking about the feed fast cycle. That is what happens when you eat and then between meals when you're not eating. So food is consumed, you eat. Sugar from that meal is stored in your liver. A little bit in your muscle is glycogen. Proteins used for growth and repair, some is excreted. And you make fat unfortunately, or fortunately. Right after eating, your energy comes from circulating fuel from that meal. But over the next four to 12 hours, you get your energy by pulling glycogen out of the liver. Now, <clears throat> that's age dependent. Young infants really don't have more than about four hours worth of glycogen in their liver, and that's why they eat so often. And as you get older, as an adult, you have more. But as you fast for a longer period than you have liver glycogen, you then begin to use fat and protein for energy. So this, I think a picture's worth a thousand words. So I use a lot of pictures. Um, this is the time after a meal, first and hour. All right, how, let's see, how about that? Is that better? That's perfect. Okay. All right, so I want to talk first about the feed fast cycle. So after you eat, you store sugar in your liver, um, and then you use, as glycogen, you use protein um, to grow and repair, and you excrete some if you take in too much, and you make fat. And then right after eating, your energy comes from circulating fuel from your meal, but over the next four to 12 hours, and this is age dependent, you get your energy from the glycogen that you stored in your liver. So 
This is age dependent. This is obviously an adult. Neonates don't have more than about four hours worth of glycogen. So that's why babies eat so often. Um, adults have more. But then as your glycogen starts to wind down and get used up, gluconeogenesis comes in. It's a long word, but glucose, neo meaning new, genesis meaning make. Your body's going to be making glucose and your fat metabolism is uh, coming on board at pretty much parallel to this. So circulating fuels, then your liver glycogen, then you're depending on protein and fat metabolism. So I want to talk a little bit about um, this metabolic process, and I wish I could have built this slide one at a time. But let's start with glucose. After you eat, the sugar stored as glycogen, and then when you need it between meals, it comes back to be glucose, and then your body can burn that glucose through a process until you make energy. The, it goes through something called the Krebs cycle. That name's going to come up again a little bit later. Now, protein, you have to take the nitrogen off, and that becomes ammonia, the same ammonia you would like to strip wax on a floor with. And the rest of that protein passes into the Krebs cycle, where it becomes energy. Now, fat... It turns out that our body deals with fats up to about 28 carbons. Fats are basically chains of carbon atoms. And the longest ones from like 20, 28 are not done in the um, mitochondria. They're done in the peroxisome. So we're not gonna talk about them. We're gonna talk today about the fats that are 18 carbons and smaller. So long chain fats are mostly what you're used to, olive oil, corn oil, um, they're 16, 18 carbons. Medium chain fats are mm, six to 10 carbons. Um, probably the most common medium chain fat you would eat would be like uh, coconut oil and short chain. So you burn fat kind of like a candle. You start with the longer chain and then you just start lopping off the end until you get down to a medium size, in which case a new branch of enzymes takes over and then down to a short size, and then another takes over. When you burn fat, it burns into acetyl-CoA and you can also convert it into ketones and ketones can be transported out to the body. Your heart loves ketones. Um, your brain will take glucose or ketones, whatever you feed it, it prefers glucose. Um, but again, everything goes through the Krebs cycle to make energy. So what else can happen? It turns out that once you have exhausted the liver glycogen, you need some glucose. Uh, so it turns out that you can go backwards through the protein to do what they call gluconeogenesis or the making of new glucose. You also, so if fatty acid, of medium chain fatty acids are turned off, if you can't metabolize them, then you're not feeding into energy, you're not feeding into the Krebs cycle, um, and you're not making glucose. It turns out that the energy that you need to make glucose is the same energy that you get from fat metabolism. So if your fat metabolism is not working, you can't feed the making of glucose. So the genetic machinery is all there to make glucose, but you don't have any energy to feed it. it it's like a car that's run out of gas. The engine's there. It would work if you gave it some gas. Um, and sometimes this process can poison the urea cycle, which is how you get rid of the extra ammonia in your body. So sometimes that can happen as well. And then you build up these medium chain intermediates from the partially broken down medium chain fat. And these are actually toxic. So this animated slide is not going to work, <laughs> but what I was going to show you is that when you get rid of this, you don't 
you decrease the acetyl-CoA and the ketones that you're making, you decrease your glucose, you increase your ammonia, and you increase your medium chain intermediates. So MCAD is an energy deficiency state where you get hypoglycemia without ketosis. Now remember, when you are starving, your body should be in a breakdown fat mode and you should be making ketones. So when your blood sugar has dropped and your body's out of gas, it should be trying as hard as it can, as fast as it can, to break down fat, so you should be ketotic. So when you see hypoglycemia without adequate ketones, that's worrisome. Sometimes you'll see ammonia elevated, and the liver can be in, uh, involved as well. And so these elevated medium chain fatty acid intermediates, they can affect your mental status, and of course hypoglycemia can also affect your mental status. Um, you can get an enlarged liver because liver is where fatty acid oxidation takes place. So your body is desperately trying to unload fat into the liver to try to make it, break it down. Um, and if you don't treat it, obviously, it could be fatal. So what's in a name? What does medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase defect mean? The, 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 obviously, the long name for MCAD. Well, we know what the medium means because it turns out that your body has three different enzyme systems for breaking down fat. One is for long chain fats that are 12 to 18 carbons. One's for medium chain fats that's six to 10 and one's for short chain. So MCAD is when you have a defect in the medium chain. Now we know what the medium chain means. Now fat, is actually hydrogen carbon, hydrogen carbon, hydro, hydrocarbon. Fat is, your, your mitochondria are basically little internal combustion engines that are burning hydrocarbon. And it's going to burn it like a candle from one end. So it's going to start here on this end with this carbon, oxygen, and, and oxygen, hydrogen, or a carboxyl group. And it's going to burn it down. This particular one, I counted last night, I think it was 14 fats, one, two, three, four, five, six, I mean carbon, seven, eight, nine, 10, no, 12 carbons. So you're gonna like light a candle, and this is the wick, and you're gonna burn it down. Now, most of the pictures you'll see, for the ease of looking at them, get rid of the carbon and the hydrogen, and they just leave you the squiggly line. And so that's what we see next. So we see this squiggly line, and then this was that um, carboxyl end. And people think metabolism is really complicated, but if you strip it down to the basics, it makes sense. So this, in this example, is an eight carbon fat, octa, eight, octopus, octanoate. Then you're going to take something called a CoA, which is a, a sort of vitamin-like substance in your body, and you're gonna light the candle, you're gonna light the wick by putting this CoA on it. So you'll take this, you'll put a CoA, and this particular kind of bond is called an acyl-CoA bond. That's just what it's named when you have a bond that looks like this with the carbon and the, the CoA. So now you know what CoA means. So now you know what medium chain acyl-CoA means. Now, when you burn fat, you start at the wick end, this is your CoA group, and you burn down the chain by lopping off two carbons at a time. So the carbons are numbered, one, two, three, four, five, and carbon two is alpha, carbon three is beta. It's called beta oxidation because, surprise, you're going to oxidize the beta carbon. So you're going to, through this process, snip it here right before the beta carbon and put a new CoA on the end. So now you have this is two carbons shorter than that one. And then you have this acetyl CoA group that's formed from these two carbons. And just to refresh your memory, this is the acetyl CoA that can be converted into ketones or burned into the Krebs cycle. So 
dehydrogenase or dehydrogenase. Where does that come from? And again, it's all in the name. And unfortunately, I wish this was a little bit bigger. So here you have a fatty acid. R just means that there's more carbons down there. They wanted to just keep the diagram simpler. Here's your CoA group. Here's your alpha carbon and your beta carbon. And the first step is an acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. That is, here's your acyl-CoA group and a dehydrogenase. So what do you think a dehydrogenase do? It dehydrogenates. It takes away hydrogens. So if you look here, there's two hydrogens here and two hydrogens here. And now after this step, there's one hydrogen there and one hydrogen there. And now you've made a double bond in there. So it does exactly what the name says. It makes a uh, it takes away hydrogens or dehydrogenase. And there's one for long chain, one for medium chain, and one for short chain. Now the long chain one got renamed very long chain, and that's like way too long for me to go into here why, but yeah, that's what you'll hear it called as very long chain and not long chain. Then in beta oxidation, there's three more steps. You add water, you hydrate it. Well, you add water, it goes over that double bond. It makes uh, oxygen hydrogen up here. And then there's another dehydrogenase step where you take this hydrogen away and make a double bond. And these are the CHAD steps. So some of you have heard of like L CHAD because it's hydroxy H. There's an H in it, acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And then now your new fat is two carbons shorter and you have made your acetyl CoA. Hopefully that all makes sense. And suddenly, I'm not able to advance my slide. There, okay. So what's in the name? Medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. Now you know what MCAD means. So individuals with MCAD have an impaired ability to do the first step of fatty acid oxidation, which is a dehydrogenase step, on medium chain fat, that is fats with six to 10 carbons. So it's not actually all that complicated when you get right down to it. So just to summarize what we talked about so far, during fasting, you use your liver glycogen up first, and when that gets exhausted, you begin, you then begin to depend on burning protein and fat for energy. Protein alone can't get the job done. You have to have energy from fat. So longer term fasting between normal meal times um, requires the ability to do fatty acid oxidation. So next question, how do we diagnose MCAD? Well, for the last 15-ish mm, years, we've been diagnosing it on newborn screening with follow-up testing. Um, and now all 50 states and most uh, westernized countries. So how did it get on the newborn screen? How, how did we make that happen? And that's a really interesting story. So MCAD's the most common disorder of fatty acid oxidation. On average worldwide, it's about one in 18,000 in uh, populations of Northern European extraction and interestingly Native American populations. It's more common than that in um, Japan. I think it's one in 50,000. So it was first described in the 1980s as one cause of Rye syndrome. Um, and before the diagnosis, once they went back and started looking for it and looking at, at uh, what was happening to children, one study saw that up to 25% of patients died during their first metabolic crisis and more were permanently damaged. So this was a big deal. It was also found to probably account for maybe about 5% of SIDS. So, so children were dying. So enter something called tandem mass spectrometry. This is a really sensitive method that detects tiny amounts of metabolites in your blood. And it does them because they can uh, join or esterify carnitine. So 
I didn't talk about carnitine yet. Carnitine is a, a kind of like a vitamin in your body. Your body makes it and you consume it. And carnitine's main job is to esterify is the medical word. Glom onto would be a non-medical word. Hook onto that carnitine. Because medium and short chain fat can just sachet their way into the mitochondria on their own and get metabolized. Long chain fat can't. The door's, the door's closed. The door's blocked. It needs a carrier to help it. So carnitine is that carrier. So carnitine hooks onto long chain fat and it pulls it into the mitochondria where it can be then burned for energy. But the problem with carnitine is that it's quite fickle. It's quite promiscuous. If it sees anything with a bunch of carbon atoms on it, it'll it'll hook onto it and it's terrify it. Once that happens, um, it then can become urine soluble and you can pee it out and deplete your carnitine. Um, but it's a good thing for the ability to detect it because carnitine is something that's easy to detect with tandem mass spectrometry. So it will tell you basically what you're looking at is what is esterified by carnitine. So it was adapted to metabolic testing in the 90s. Um, and then they realized they could do it on blood spots, which is what newborn screening is. And a tandem mass spectrometry analysis can diagnose like 50 or more metabolic diseases. So, you know, before tandem mass spectrometry, most states were screening for like five to seven disorders. So we had this enormous leap from being able to do, you know, five to seven to 50. Now, just to think a little more about tandem mass spectrometry, think about the way molecules or objects break. They break at their weakest link. If you took this mug and dropped it off the Empire State Building, it, when it hit the bottom, it'd probably make powder. It would go to smithereens. But if you're loading the dishwasher and your hands are wet and you drop it just a short distance onto the dishwasher door, um, it's probably going to break at the handle because that's its weakest point. So you it dropped with just enough energy to break its weakest point, but not enough to break the rest of it. And that, that concept is going to become important. So this is just a pictorial diagram of a tandem mass spectrometry. Um, you have, uh, you take your sample and there's a lot of compounds in your blood. And you need to try to make sense out of it. People have heard of spect mass spectrometry in like NCIS, if you watch any of those shows where they're trying to figure out what poison was used or this or that. Um, so, But there's an awful lot of stuff in the blood and you need to kind of narrow down what you're looking at. So you put it through the first mass spectrometer and you say, give me things with the signature of carnitine. Yeah, where it broke in a shape that I, I know that there's carnitine attached to it. And then you're gonna fragment it again with, with again, just the right amount of energy to not smash it to smithereens, but break it down into even smaller pieces, put it through a second one, and then you can detect it and it will tell you what was a sterifier joined onto that carnitine. So Dr. Dieter Matern at Mayo, who's a metabolic uh, physician, uh, actually made this really nice analogy um that oh i can't play um they wanted to look at the parking lot at mayo to see how many mercedes there were so they took them all out in the autobahn in the gas in and in, um, in the fog crashed them all up and then sifted the remains to find identifiable fragments that could tell you what it belonged to and in this case the hood ornaments and they found, he found actually three when he actually went and counted all them. But that's, that's a nice uh, analogy. So once people figured out you could adapt tandem mass spectrometry to newborn screening, we had a problem. Because we didn't understand all the things that we were identifying. There were lots of things on there that we weren't even sure were disorders. We weren't sure they needed to be treated. We weren't sure how to treat them. We didn't really know much about it. And to just sort of move to this on the, uh, you know, just stick it on the screen and figure out we'll deal with it later, um, 
could be considered experimenting on people without doing any research and pilot work on it. So should we, and we actually had arguments at, at a metabolic meeting that we had in California in the late 90s um, or early 2000s, you know, should we just do it and save the babies with MCAD? Um, or should we figure what we're doing first? So in 1999, Massachusetts actually started a pilot screening program. Women could opt in. Um, so when you show up and you're in labor and they shove all those papers in front of your face, one of them was, do you want to opt into this research project or we're going to do these extra tests on your baby and we might not really exactly know what it means. And interestingly, they got about more, more than 80% um, opt in. So then they began to be able to gather data. But in the end, the families took it out of the doctor's hands. Um, families with MCAT in their family, um, unfortunately helped by a private company that um, could make money from screening, um, started to lobby all the state legislatures because newborn screening is uh, run by states. It's, not, it's like marriage. It's not run by the federal government. Um, started lawsuits of, you know, why, why is my child dead when the, you could have had this test that could have saved them. Uh, in 2006, the American College of Medical Genetics uh, finally developed sort of criteria for what should be the primary and secondary screening disorders. And there are still disorders on the screen that are controversial. There are some that some European countries have taken off the screen that the U.S. has still left on. Um, but MCAT is not one of the controversial ones. We know, we know that this is, is saving lives. So just to look at, at this, if you look at two carbons that are esterified to carnitine, three carbons, 16 carbons, this is a normal, but if you look in this patient with MCAT deficiency, there's not much going on here on the normal scan, but you can see there's this big peak um, up here of the six, eight, and 10. And you can eke out a little enzyme activity against 10 by the long chain enzyme and some activity against six by the short chain enzyme, but poor eight stands all by itself. Neither the long nor the short chain enzyme will help it. So the, the typical pattern you see in MCAT is this big peak of C8 with smaller peaks of C6 and C10. So how do we confirm the diagnosis or how do we make the diagnosis in somebody who's older and didn't get newborn screening or for some reason didn't show up? You can do this ACL carnitine analysis at any time, follow up blood testing. And so that would be one of our big tests on somebody who's having hypoglycemia or uh, falling apart when they get ill. We don't know what's wrong with them. Um, ACL carnitine is one of the first tests we do. Organic acids, there are some others. DNA analysis is usually quite helpful. And as we go along, you'll see why. We no longer do the enzyme assay routinely in the United States because number one, we think we can get the information we need from these. And number two, it, it requires a skin biopsy um, and growing cells. And there's also quite a bit of overlap between normals and carriers that makes it a lot less useful. So MCAT is an enzyme. Enzymes promote chemical reactions. So in this case, the chemical reaction is taking hydrogens away from that medium chain fat. Enzymes are made from protein. Proteins are made from genes. And then after they're made, they have to fold up into the right shape. And a gene with a mistake or a variant might cause the protein to take an incorrect shape. I mean, if the gene's totally gone, it might mean you don't make any of that enzyme at all. Um, if there, but a lot of the times the mistake just makes the protein fold up into the wrong shape. So this is actually a pictorial diagram of um, MCAD. It's four identical components that hook themselves together and they make a little pocket. And that little pocket is just the right shape for that fatty acid of six to 10 carbons to slip in and get its hydrogen sucked off. So a lot of people, if you remember high school biology, talked about enzymes with the lock and key analogy, that if the enzyme and the substrate shape matches exactly, it slips right in and does the job. But if there's a mismatch, 
it doesn't work. So the analogy I would think of is you come home with a key from the hardware store that you've copied for your door and you put it in and you turn it and the door opens right up. That's great. But sometimes you put it in and turn it and it didn't copy exactly faithfully and the key doesn't work. So that would be somebody then that the enzyme didn't work at all. Uh, but sometimes you can jimmy and jiggle and finally kind of get it to catch in and work enough to get the door open. And that's the way some of the DNA variants work. They produce an enzyme that's not quite right and varying degrees it might work a little and it just depends on and how far off it is whether it's going to work at all a little how hard it's going to work how well it's going to work so that that's pretty you know the lock and key is a pretty good analogy so for those who did take biology in a long time genes are composed of strings of four different bases adenine guanine cytosine and thymine it's literally those four strung together in various uh, A, G, A, T, C, C. So it's the string of them um, that really code for pretty much everything. So the most common European variant present in about 90% of NCAD patients have at least one copy of something called 985A to G. That means that base pair 985, the base adenine's been replaced by guanine. And so that changes the protein structure. When the protein reads off the DNA strand and says, okay, what amino acid should I put next? What next? What next? Um, you make the wrong one. So K304E, I think it's a lysine is replaced by a glutamine. And that affects the way the protein folds. Um, the most common Asian variant is where there's actually four, um, four bases missing. Um, and that actually throws the whole reading frame off. It takes all the letters and mashes them up in, in an order that kind of doesn't make sense. So MCAD's inherited. We, get, we have two copies of each of our genes, one from mom, and one from dad. And MCAD's a recessive disorder, meaning it's hidden. It means both copies of the gene have to be impaired in order to be symptomatic. So the parents who each have one broken copy of the gene are fine. Um, sometimes carriers will show up as having elevated metabolites. And so they'll sometimes show up, particularly on a newborn screen, but they, they're not symptomatic. So if parents are carriers, each of their children has a 25% risk to have MCAD, and eggs and sperm don't have memories. So just because your first child doesn't have, uh, has MCAD doesn't mean the next three won't. It's a 25% risk for every conception. So if you have a carrier father and carrier mother, the chance that they both pass down the working gene is 25% the chance one of them passes down the working gene and the other one passes down the variant gene is 25% from each parent. Because it both can happen two ways, so that's 50%. And then there's a 25% chance that both parents pass down the, the uh, affected gene. So one of the things that really came up as interesting with newborn screening and MCAD that really kind of changed the way we thought about it is, is MCAT all or nothing? You either have MCAT or you don't? Or is it just the extreme end of a continuum, that there's a continuum of how well your gene, how well your enzyme works? And at some point, it gets bad enough that you're called having MCAT deficiency. So this article, I, I don't want to confuse you, but... Um, this, these you don't have to worry about. These are long chain enzymes. This is the octanoyl carnitine or the eight carbon um, carnitine. And these circles are the MCAD patients. So it's the ones on this row. And the purple are patients who are affected with MCAD and the gray are patients who um, are carriers of MCAD. And then down in here, there's the normal population. So you can see that <clears throat> there's overlap on the newborn screen 
this are the octanoyl carnitine levels between carriers and uh, people who are affected. And even if you look, you can see down here, look, there's this affected person um, who's way down in the carriers. And then there's some of these carriers that are way up in the, well, it gotta be if you're affected. And then there's, there's, a, there's a lot of mixing going on. So how then do you decide in newborn screen where to cut it off? How do you, how do you decide where you're gonna say, let's call this normal and this abnormal. And so you have to make a decision. Most states are using, you know, around 0.5 as a cutoff. So you can see that this child will be missed. How could this, how could they be missed? Well, it turns out, as we said, you're looking for the C8 that is esterified to carnitine. If you have a mom who's carnitine deficient, uh, you know, um, either because her carnitine working enzymes don't work that well. Pregnant women have lower carnitine anyway. If you're a vegan and you're not eating anything with carnitine in it, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you could have like a carnitine deficient mom. And that's not going to show up then um, and the baby. So a newborn screening is a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. If you set your normal down here, you would have so many false positives, you wouldn't be able to keep up with them. It would, but if you set your normal here, where you're not going to have a lot of false positives, you're going to miss a lot of effective. So it's it's a balance beam. You have to figure out where you want to set your normals. Most set it at about 0.5 or so. So if the cutoffs to be normal or abnormal or arbitrary, and if carriers can have abnormals tests, and if some people have variants in the MCAT gene that lead to variants in the enzyme that just don't work very well, but they do work. Is there such a thing as you either have MCAT or you don't? Or is it a continuum of the expression of your MCAT enzyme? Um, and we hadn't really thought much about this before newborn screening. We thought, you know, you were going to get an answer, yes or no. And now we have kids who have gene variants that are not working up to snuff, but is it really bad enough for them to ever get sick enough to be tipped over? So it's, it's left us with an interesting question, but does that mean there's mild versus severe MCAT? And the answer is yes. And so clearly, there are some gene variants that just knock the enzyme out and are associated with, with higher risk of having severe disease. And there's clear relationships between people who have very low enzyme activity and, and how much abnormal metabolites they make. And it's clear that the, the infants with the really highest abnormal newborn screens are at higher risk. Now, we talked about 0.5 being a cutoff. You know, now we're talking about people, you know, 10, 15, 35. The highest I ever saw, I think, was a 42. They're clearly abnormal. Um, but what about somebody who looks like they have a mild mutation, um, a mild gene variant? And the question is, how do you know? That they'll never get pushed hard enough, starved hard enough, stressed enough metabolically to be dangerous. And so that's, it's clear that we have to really, really consider the kids with really abnormal gene variants and really high C8s at very high risk. But we're not really willing to just say, yeah, on the patients who appear to be at lower risk. So, what do we know about management? In the, I actually started my training in 1989, and MCAD was still somewhat new. Um, and interestingly, the very first page I got as a new metabolic fellow in my first day was a mother who called and said, my child has MCAD and is vomiting. And I don't think she was really reassured by my question, what is MCAD? Because I'd learned nothing about it in medical school or residency. And, and in fact, a lot of docs today still haven't really heard much about it. 
So in the early years, we gave everybody glucose meters. And we sometimes put them on fat-restricted diets. And we gave everybody carnitine. Well, the glucose meters make families crazy. Um, if, you're, if you have a glucose meter at home, try, you know, dipping your finger in orange juice and then doing it. You know, you're going to get a 200. Um, on the other hand, if you don't get quite enough blood in it, you can get a falsely low reading. And the new meters are better at that in terms of not giving you a reading if you don't have enough blood. But still, you know, I, I've had parents call me, well, I did it and it was 60 and then I did it again and it was 200. And, you know, it, so and it turns out you can die before you get hypoglycemic. In fact, the sickest MCAT patient I ever took care of really almost never got hypoglycemic. Um, but she would get extremely ill. Um, and so most of us don't use glucose meters anymore. There may still be some centers that, that do, but I've abandoned them. Fat-restricted diets. Well, I had a patient who was in my town visiting grandparents of 15 months and had a hypoglycemic seizure and I diagnosed her with MCAT. She went home, now this was early 90s, uh, was cared for by an adult endocrinologist who put her on a fat-restricted diet and a, uh, a hypogly anti-hypoglycemia diet, which, you know, after you eat a lot of sugar, your insulin goes up. And then there's this little mismatch time when your insulin's still up, but your glucose is coming down. That's sort of like what happens to you at 10 a.m. when you have donuts for breakfast. Um, so he, to even avoid that, and this poor child between 15 and 18 months gained absolutely no weight. And the mother came back for another opinion because they told her that she was going to have to quit her job. They were going to put a feeding tube in the child and, and she would have to stay home and feed the child all day. And, and, and you know, what self-respecting 18 months old eats cardboard, which is all they had given her to eat pretty much. So, you know, we don't restrict like that anymore. Um, there was a little craze for a while where parents were not wanting to give their kids coconut because coconut oil has C8 in it. But really, you know, I, I've i never heard of anybody getting into trouble from eating a Mounds bar. So we kind of made people crazy. So you want to end the, the video clip here? I'm not hungry. You're having one more bite. No. One more bite. All right. That's what we did to people. Don't do that. <laughs> um, little kids not only figure out how to use electronic devices really quickly, even when they can't read and write yet, they know how to find their parents' buttons. And you really are going to have trouble if you get into this with your child. Um, so the current management, the gold standard is prevention of fasting. We don't restrict dip, uh, fat in the diet, although I will tell you, on an American diet, a heart-healthy 30% of calories from fat probably is a little bit of a restriction because we eat so much fat in this country. Um, but it's also a good time for the whole family to clean it up because nobody needs a double quarter pounder with cheese and a supersized order of fries. You just don't. So it's a healthy diet. Um, now, we take babies a lot more seriously. One is because a lot of times they haven't declared themselves yet for how um, brittle they're going to be, but also because a baby can't, you know, get up out of bed and make a sandwich and they can't necessarily say, mommy, I'm hungry, um, particularly in the middle of the night. So we do take a lot more care and we, we do feed on a, a more adjusted schedule. Some places try to use weight-based or age-based. That is that, you know, um, if you're seven months, you could sleep for seven hours. Um, we do recommend bedtime snacks just because young children sleep a lot longer than adults do. Um, and so once you get to a point where we think you can safely sleep through the night, we do want to give you a little charge at bedtime. Um, heart healthy, and we do follow carnitine levels Carnitine can become deficient. Like I said earlier, once you once you esterify the carnitine to the medium chain fat, then it becomes your insoluble. You can pee it out. You can be deficient. Your heart loves ketones. Now, the long chain fat disorders um, often present with cardiomyopathy or heart conduction um, defects. 
or rhythm defects. It's very unusual in MCAD, very unusual, although it's been reported. So we don't want people to get deficient. But on the other hand, those, car those ACL carnitines, when they build up, they may be toxic. So some people think when you give carnitine, you're, you're, give, you're helping them to make more toxic metabolites. So it's a dance. Um, uh, we don't want you to have too much. We don't want you to have too little. So the point is most children with MCAD deficiency are fine with a normal feeding schedule as long as their appetite's intact. There are exceptions to this. That's why the asterisk is next to most. I had one patient whose newborn screen C C8 was, I think, 37, was already very, very ill by the time the screen came back, would have died, I think, without newborn screening. Um, and that child actually had a very short fasting interval um, and ended up with a feeding tube as a young child, which I've never put a feeding tube in any other child with them yet. So generally, if your child is so brittle that they can't undergo normal feed fast cycles, um, you probably already know it. What are the things to worry about? Gastroenteritis, gastroenteritis, and gastroenteritis. Almost all the children that have had a bad outcome with MCAT have had gastroenteritis. Um, other illnesses that affect your appetite, like the cold sore virus. Sometimes the very first infection you get as a young child, you get sores all over your whole mouth, just not just a sore or two on your lip. Um, and you know, they're not gonna eat. Um, we worry more about the kids who have the severe DNA variants or the um, or the um, uh, uh, higher levels. We worry about uh, newborn. Uh, we worry the newborn and toddler period. Alcohol. Adults have died. With, adults with them can have died <clears throat> after alcohol binges because alcohol not only does it make you vomit. Um, but it also impairs your ability to make glucose. So you, you really will get yourself in trouble. And then adult doctors. Uh, adult doctors, a lot of them just don't know anything about MCAD. Um, so standard pediatric advice when your child is sick, can they keep down an ounce an hour? And if you don't have MCAD, that's, that's good advice. But if your child has MCAD, that's not good advice. Give them Pedialyte. Pedialyte has almost no sugar in it. And well, don't worry unless your child's dehydrated or hypoglycemic. This is all bad advice. If you call a doc with your MCAT child and you get this advice, you know that they don't understand MCAT um, and you should call somebody else. And for adults, you know, adults, um, it, adults really, um, They don't know anything about MCAD, but they know a lot about diabetes, and they see a lot of diabetes. So when they see an adult coming in with all this glucose running, you know, their first instinct is to shut it off, um, and that isn't going to work. <laughs> so um, you have to really pay attention. And what, what makes adults starve? A, a car accident or something where you can't speak for yourself? Gallbladder attack? Childbirth? You know, who wants to eat a huge meal when you're in childbirth? Um, so what not to worry about, I, I'm running let low on time here. Um, kids' growth slows down. So in the, if you are born at seven pounds and by six months you weigh 14, that's a hundred percent increase in your weight. And then in the next year, you'll gain, uh, I'm sorry, you'll, but in the next six months, you'll gain another seven pounds. That's 50% of your weight. And then in the next year, you're only going to gain like four pounds. So it's like 20% of your weight. So their growth really slows down, and parents really notice this at about 12 months. Um, and also, appetites go up and down. You know, when kids are having growth spurts, they're hungry. When they're not having growth spurts, they're not so hungry. Um, and so, you know, this is ideally what you want. A child who never sees you sweat about their eating and who regulates their own appetite. And you need to worry about them when they don't have control of their appetite, like when they're sick. So I'll go quickly through the rest. Um, what about sports? Well, any sport that makes you have forced weight control is, is a no-go. 
can your little girl put on the pink tutu and take ballet lessons? Absolutely. And you can cry while they're on the stage. But should they try to become a professional ballerina where they're going to be starved to death? And no. Wrestling for boys. If they really want to wrestle, you're going to have to have a coach who lets them wrestle at whatever weight they are. No, no making weight. And I'm kidding. Um, I've had athletic patients who've learned they had to snack. Um, alcohol and crash dieting, bad, bad, bad. Um, so, and, and everybody, you need a medical alert device. I, they make some pretty ones now if you're willing to spend a little extra. So what's next? I think Dr. Vockley already talked about this, so I'm not going to make much, but you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and you can put MK into the search engine. I did that yesterday. There's not a lot really in the United States actively enrolling right now. Uh, in, in Pittsburgh, we've got several things going on. One is something called a chaperone, and one is called an anaplerotic agent. So this is phenylbutyrate, and this is something called triheptanone, which is a seven carbon fat. And it turns out that with MK deficiency, Phenylbutyryl CoA, it's, it's a it's a fatty molecule with a CoA on it, and the MCAN enzyme actually can take it in and work on it, and, and take away its hydrogens too, um, and that can actually, but it can actually help hold the protein in the correct position. So we think that for folding defects, things called chaperones, other things that can get in there and help hold that protein in, in the right. Uh, formation can be helpful. And so we've already done some um, work. Uh, and it looks like acylglycine, glycines are another thing that is sterify these C8 metabolites. And it looks like the more butyrate you give, um, the more, uh, the, the less abnormal metabolites you make. Um, the other one is what we call um, anaplerosis, which basically means feeding the Krebs cycle. Um, so it turns out, and I won't go through all these numbers, that um, triheptanoin is a seven carbon fat and it gets broken down by the short chain enzyme. So you could feed somebody C7 or triheptanoin and that will feed into their Krebs cycle, you end up with a three carbon piece at the end that feeds into the Krebs cycle. So you can give them more energy. So that is in the very early phases of trying to set up some research for that. So none of these things, um, so we're not ready to enroll patients in either study right now. We're, we're moving the phenylbutyrate study um, into a new phase. We'll soon be looking, we hope, for, for patients. And the uh, um, the triheptanoin, we're starting working on setting up the initial studies. But we'll keep the light on for you. Um, if you want to get involved with research studies, keep watching the website, keep checking back in at clinicaltrials.gov, and you can find out when we're ready to re-enroll for these. So are you a good genie or a bad genie, you MCAD gene? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so. I hope this was helpful. Um, I ran a few minutes late, but I started quite a bit late. And um, if you have questions, you can um, email them to me or ask Dr. Rockley or Dr. Corson or look at here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. That was very informative. I am the patient support coordinator for Mito Action, and I speak uh, weekly with uh, adult young adult and uh, middle-aged adults who have just recently been diagnosed with MCAD. And I feel like you gave me a lot of information to point them to and how to help them uh, get over being with the thought of, well, if it wasn't diagnosed at birth, how am I still alive? Um, I think knowing that there's, it's a, con, uh, what did you call it? A compendium of uh, yeah. a disease I think is, is very important. Um, I'm going to put the polling questions on. 
And if you want to go ahead and go underneath the polling tab on the right hand side of your screen, we would really appreciate that feedback for, to help us better understand these topics a little bit more. And I just really want to thank everyone for uh, staying with us today. I do apologize for running over the last session. So we ran over a little bit here, but definitely worth all of this information that we learned today. So when you're ready, just head back over to auditorium one and we will be discussing lab testing with Dr. Longo.